Good evening. I'm Larry Temple, and as chairman of the OBJ Foundation, it's my privilege to welcome all of you here tonight and introduce this program. While this is a Friends of the OBJ Library program, uh, we also uh, are joined this night by some very special guests, the Presidential Leadership Scholar Class of 2018. You don't have to whoop because I'm going to introduce you if you stand up in a minute. Uh, the uh, Presidential uh, Leadership Scholars Program was launched by George W. Bush and Bill Clinton in 2015, and it's a joint venture initiative of the George H.W. Bush Library and uh, Foundation, the Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and LBJ Libraries and Foundations. Uh, each year, 60 outstanding individuals from the public and private sectors who are working either full-time or part-time on philanthropies are chosen to study lessons in leadership from the four presidents our institutions represent. These folks are doing truly remarkable things to enhance their communities, our nation, and the world. And our hope is that the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program better positions them to advance their noble efforts. Now these uh, scholars uh, spend several days at each of the presidential libraries. They've already been to the Clinton and the two Bush libraries, and now they're here uh, for three days with us, and we're honored to have them. They're really, truly outstanding people, and I'd ask all of the 2018 presiden presidential leadership scholars to stand up and be recognized. <laughs> Now later this month, we have a special program for the Friends of the LBJ Library. On Friday, June 29, the LBJ Foundation will give our highest honor, the LBJ Liberty and Justice for All Award, to Senator John McCain. The Liberty, uh, <laughs> that award was created by the Foundation to recognize individuals who in, in their own way, in their own time, carry on the legacy of Lyndon Johnson to open the doors of opportunity for all of our citizens. And certainly Senator McCain is uh, worthy of that award that's been previously given to several people, including Presidents George H.W. Bush and Jimmy Carter. Uh, the award will be accepted on that evening by uh, Senator McCain's daughter, Megan McCain, uh, who will talk about the remarkable life and legacy of her father in a conversation with Mark Updegrove. All of you may know Megan as a media personality who appears regularly on ABC on The View, This Week with George Stephanopoulos, and Good Morning America. I think you won't want to miss a, a very great program on that evening. Now, on to this evening's program. A half a century ago, our nation was rocked to its core by the momentous events that played out throughout one of the most transformative and consequential years in the history of this country. In 1968, our nation was at war against an intractable enemy, and it was also divided at home. LBJ, in his last full year in office, called it simply the nightmare year. Time magazine, uh, viewed it this way. 1968 had the vibrations of an earthquake about it. Deaths of heroes, uprisings, suppressions, the end of dreams, blood in the streets in Chicago and Paris and Saigon, and at last at Christmas time, man for the first time floating around the moon. Tonight we will hear from two people who were at the White House by President Johnson's side in 1968. Linda Johnson Robb is the elder daughter of Lyndon and Lady Bird Johnson and lived in the White House with her parents in 1968, newly wedded and expecting her first child while her husband, Marine Captain Chuck Robb, was in Vietnam. And Tom Johnson, no relation to President Johnson, although I think he sometimes claims it, uh, who first went to the White House as a member of the inaugural class of White House fellows in 1965 
before transitioning to a full-time aide of President Johnson, remained with the President uh, through the balance of his term. We will also hear from Bill Moyers. Bill was editor of Newsday in 1968, but had previously served in the Johnson White House, first as an aide to President Johnson from 1963 to 1965, and then as press secretary from 1967 to 1966 to 1967. And fi finally, Kyle Longley will provide a historian's perspective of the year. Kyle is a professor of history at Arizona State University. His well-received book, LBJ's 1968, now think about that, LBJ's 1968 was published in March and chronicles that year that was among the most trying any president ever faced. That uh, group will uh, engage in a conversation with Mark Updegrove, who formerly was director of the LBJ Library and is now the wonderful president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Linda Johnson Robb, Tom Johnson, Bill Moyers, Kyle Longley, and Mark Updegrove. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome, uh, panelists. I, I believe that you all saw a montage of photographs accompanied by music from 1968, and it showed all of the momentous events that played out during that uh, extraordinarily tempestuous year. Kyle Longley, whose book, LBJ's 1968, I certainly commend to you, wrote in the introduction to his book, um, Time Magazine, we heard Larry Temple just quote Time Magazine, Kyle does the same thing. He writes, Time proclaimed 1968 as one damn thing after another. Indeed, one tragic, surprising, and perplexing thing after another. Events that moved at a pace of an avant-garde movie edited by mad clutter. And then he writes, they were correct and Lyndon Johnson had a front row seat to the entire drama that he desperately tried to manage under pressures endured by few American presidents. So Kyle, let's start with you. Um, welcome to the LBJ Library. Thank you, it's always good to be back in Austin. Good, it's good to have you back. So uh, take us briefly, as, as the historian on the panel, take us very briefly through all the events that played out during 1968? Well, it's a long litany. Uh, I start the book with the State of the Union Address just to sort of set the context for what is coming for the year. But again, right after that, it all the crap hits the fan. Uh, the president is gonna characterize it as a year of a continuous nightmare. And I think that's a very uh, appropriate characterization. So you start with the Pueblo, Straight after that, eight days later, uh, Tet Offensive. USS, talk, talk about, so the USS yes. Pueblo is a U.S. ship off the Korean shore. Talk, right. Just talk about briefly what happened with the USS Pueblo. A U.S. intelligence ship is taken by the North Koreans, uh, and it just sort of makes the point that North Koreans have been trying to tweak us for a lot of years. <laughs> so it resonates with today, uh, and we did not understand it. Uh, it was difficult to ascertain why they did it but they would hold hostages until December of 1968. President at one time grows so frustrated, he, he comments to an aide, he says, I'd meet with the North Koreans naked in the middle of the street, if that meant getting them back. So we have the Pueblo, then you have the Tet Offensive, and many people here in the audience, I'm sure, remember the Tet Offensive. The pictures of the Saigon police chief executing the Viet Cong right there on the camera. Uh, you know, the argument is we've been winning the war, suddenly they're attacking everywhere across the country. So this calls into question our policy in Vietnam, and by March 31st, 1968, the president has reached the point after being advised by a number of people, including the wise men, that it's time to dedicate himself to extricating the United States from Vietnam. The, Hopefully the, the wise the, men being the elders that he convened exactly. to talk about the war. The right. Dean Atchison's and others, but also within his own cabinet. Uh, Robert McNamara, Clark Clifford, uh, Rostow, you see numerous bureaucratic uh, battles going on. So Tet leads to March 31st, where I think the two major points 
One, he is determined to try to secure peace in Vietnam. I also think that his health issues are playing a role in his decision not to seek re-election. You know, he's riding a, a, a high wave after that uh, March 31st uh, speech. His poll numbers flip uh, from negatives to a significant, like 60% positive. But a few days later, Martin Luther King's assassinated. And everything just, uh, the race riots break out throughout the country, and it just appears the country's coming apart at the seams. And what I cover in the book, there's many other things that I don't cover in the book, like the Poor People's March, but we do see, you know, uh, then June, just recently, the, uh, the uh, acknowledgement of Bobby Kennedy's assassination. So again, the country just come, appears to be coming apart at the seams, and it doesn't seem to get any better through the summer of 1968. He does appear to be making some progress over Vietnam, uh, but then it meets a, a reality of debating what the table is going to look like, who's going to participate. And then you lead into August of 1968, which is a terrible year, or a terrible month with the Democratic National Convention as well as the invasion of Czechoslovakia Prague by Spring. the Warsaw. Sure. Yeah. The Prague Spring is destroyed in August of 1968, right about the same time the riots in the streets in Chicago. And so you see, and then not long after, you see the failed nomination of A. Fortas. Uh, where his uh, nomination for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, along with Homer Thornberry, is defeated. One of the first times in American history, and definitely starts the politicization of the Supreme Court. The argument being in the Fortis case by Robert Griffith, the president who is not running for re-election should not be able to name the next Supreme Court Justice. So, another area we hear resonance. Right. And then concluding with the fall, the election, uh, trying to support Humphrey, but also trying to appear above the fray, leading into the Chenault Affair. And that's what sort of concludes in late October of 1968 with the Nixon administration, or Nixon campaign, uh, actively trying to undermine the peace process uh, in Paris. I'll come back to you on the Chenault yes. Affair. But talk about how the year ends, and we'll talk about that further as we get toward the end of the program, but talk, talk about how it ends. Well, it ends with the Nixon election, and then President Johnson is still trying to actively reach out to the Russians to negotiate over arms reductions. That had been almost in place. A summit had been uh, in the process of being announced when the Russians invade Czechoslovakia in right. August. Right. And that was going to be sort of a cap to what he hoped was a good year, along with the breakthrough that he hoped in late October of 1968 uh, in Paris that would bring the uh, parties together. And when he said in March 31st of 1968, he said, I want by the time I leave office for the last people to be planning to leave Vietnam, or right. the last Americans. Right. And we know that is not going to occur, partly. Uh, I think there's many levels to explain that. But right. I think it plays out very much. And so he leaves office on January 20th, 1969, uh, ending the presidency and bringing Richard Nixon into the White House. And we can talk more about some of the issues related to the Schnault affair and how that played out. Great. We, we, we see in back of us as the, um, as the backdrop here, uh, perhaps one of the most raw images uh, ever captured of any president. It shows the agony that, that President Johnson went through during the course of 19, so this was taken uh, in, in the course of 1968. Uh, but, uh, and it seems to me, Bill, that there are very few presidents who endured the kind of pressures that LBJ did given the events of his presidency. Uh, Lady Bird Johnson said of her husband, Lyndon, is a good man to have around in a tight spot by, by, by way of meaning that he was a great crisis manager. So what made Lyndon Johnson a good man to have around in a crisis? Well, take the day of the assassination. Right. This man had given up any real thought of ever being president, making his peace with being vice president, maybe leaving. He, there was talk of him leaving. And suddenly, in a Split second, three gunshot put him into the presidency and begin his presidency in the uh, one of the rooms at the hospital in Dallas. He, I wasn't there. I joined him on Air Force One coming back to Washington. I cannot, as, as I said earlier this afternoon in our, in our symposium, never seen anyone calmer, more uh, collected, more focused on, first of all, the... Uh, that Mrs. Kennedy was aboard. He was mm -hmm. very solicitous of her. Tried to, he didn't know how, how do you deal with a, 
a, a, a presidential wife who's just been made a widow and you're on the plane with her. Right. He handled that with protocol and, and, and sympathy and not excess. He went into what had been Kennedy's uh, private room uh, study and I could see some of the Kennedy people just, you know, it was, they didn't resent it, I don't think, but it wasn't, that was Kennedy's room. Mm. And he went in there and I went in later to take him a message and the Secret Service had pulled all the shades down in the portals of the plane and he had opened one, was looking out. I said, Mr. President, what do you think? I had a message that he didn't want it. I said, what are you thinking? He didn't answer it. And I said, what do you, I'd like to know, what are you thinking? He said, are the missiles flying? And as I thought about that later, you know, here was the president, suddenly made commander in chief, never been in the chain of the black box and all of that, uh, sitting there calmly trying to figure it out. We, we could only get so many messages from uh, Pentagon and others because the, the, the uh, communications have been very tailored to limit the contacts because they wanted to try to intercept what else was happening in the world. And, uh, and he didn't say that with alarm. He didn't say that with uh, fear. He just said, "Is is if what's going on? What this could be a moment that we'll never uh, survive." But he sat down at the table and dictated to two or three of us. But this was before the night when he did the same thing again. Exactly what his agenda was going to be doing: six items on there: civil rights, tax cut, uh, poverty, and uh, three others. I don't remember now. But every, from the moment, I, and I picked this up from Kenny O'Donnell and others who were at the hospital, he was restrained, recollecting, and committing what he had to do in the next 24 hours for which he was not prepared. Mm. There was something about him at the center in the middle of crisis. He could really pull himself together. Mm. Linda, um, how did the pressures of the office manifest themselves uh, when he was out of the office, when he was in the residence, when he was, when he was a family man? Well, I, my husband was in Vietnam, and I told him, you took the easy way out. <laughs> you went to Vietnam. <laughs> you should have, you know, if you think you had it tough, you should have had to be there in the White House living through all of this. <laughs> And I really didn't even mean it laughingly because it really was true. Um, you know, he didn't have to worry about anything other than to try to keep his men safe and to keep himself safe and things like that. But every day there was a new crisis with, with what was going on where, where we were. And um, uh, it was, You woke up every day and just hoped that it wouldn't be as bad as the one you just, uh, the, the day before. Well, we'll talk about that because for you, it's got to be very strange. You're, you're sending your husband off to war. Uh, you are expecting your first child. Uh, and that, that same war, these, let me go back to the war, the same war that you're sending him uh, out to, there are people protesting against outside of the White House gates chanting, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? And your, your husband's going to that very war, and your father's the command. Talk about what that's like for you. Well, I would have to say that I was very me-focused, particularly looking at it with 50 years plus uh, behind me. Um, and first, I, uh, we got married in December. He left in March. I spent a good part of March going out to, uh, with him to the West Coast for he, he got his training uh, there. And I put him on the airplane with um, a box of, of cookies. And you know they say that in life you'll see everybody twice. Well, the, um, some of the people at Pendleton Camp Pendleton, which is the big marine um, uh, base, some of the people were kind of curious about me. Chuck was a captain in the Marine Corps, and here I was the commander in chief's daughter. And so with marine protocol, you can imagine the, the uh, commander in chief's wife couldn't have a tea party for me 
I mean, that was you know, too much. But his aide could, his aide's wife could. So they asked his wife to have a tea party, and then you could invite all of, you know, the, you could invite the, the wife of, of, the, uh, uh, of the commander of uh, Pentagon, all, I mean, uh, Pendleton, all of those people to come. So I came, and, and the wonderful, wonderful uh, woman who uh, was a, uh, whose husband was the aide, she let me use her, her kitchen to make cookies for Chuck for him to take to Vietnam. And it turned out that Bill, uh, Bill's husband, Bill Griffith's husband, was the son of one of Daddy's uh, district chiefs, political person. <laughs> now, how did God plan that? I mean, he planned it, <laughs> but how did it happen? I mean, it's just amazing. And um, the end of that story is that Bill went over for a second tour. And while Sally was bringing her, their daughter to Lucinda Robb's first birthday, she was expecting her second child, and he was killed in Vietnam. Um, it could have been my husband. It could have been any of them. And so I think I focused Daddy. Uh, I, I represented all of the wives mm. and the mothers who were like me. They're waiting and praying and hoping and, and just desperate to get their loved ones home. Uh, and Lucy uh, has said that she thought that that was one of the motivations, um, just seeing me all the time there and hearing some of Chuck's letters. Um, in March, and tapes. And, tapes. and tapes, oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Chuck sent me a few tapes, and you, you hear Daddy listening to one of these tapes. Now Chuck tried not to, to tell me too many horrible things because he wanted me, you know, he, worried, he didn't want me to worry. I mean, he told me when he left from Pendleton, he said, don't worry, if anything happens to me, the Marine Corps will take care of everything. And I want to be buried in Arlington, <laughs> which has been a fight with us since then, because I want LBJ Cemetery. But anyway, um, it was, I was very me focused, as I said. I was concerned about getting Chuck back safely and delivering a healthy baby. That was my agenda. Daddy had many other things, but that was what I was focused with. Now, I would not take a little bit of issue with you on the March decision because Daddy and Mother, Daddy had talked about not running before. And Mother, being the history student, had looked up to see what Truman did. And March gave, he thought, enough time before the, cam before the election to give the party a chance to find somebody else, but not so much that he wouldn't have any political clout because once he left, once he said that in March 31st, no matter what happened in the polls, a lot of those members of Congress knew that he couldn't uh, do anything, that he was a dead duck. And so therefore, um, there wasn't the motivation to keep supporting him and all the things. Now, Daddy used every opportunity to, to try to get the Congress to, as y'all will talk about with, with the gun bill hmm. uh, after Bobby Kennedy was shot with, uh, uh, with the ha fair housing after uh, Martin Luther King was, was shot. But um, what I brought to him was the stories where Chuck would write me and say, um, today I just missed being killed. I heard an incoming and I jumped into a two-person foxhole. I didn't even know there was such a thing. Two-person foxhole, and uh, five people jumped in with me. And the, um, uh, the shot went right over us and landed, fortunately, on the, within six inches of the hole. But fortunately, the... Uh, the firepower went the opposite direction. He said, if it had gone the other way, 
those six inches, all of us would have been killed. Now, that makes you focus on life. Uh, when he would write and tell me a letter about how he was um, guiding, uh, uh, taking some, some provisions to another unit, he was a company commander, and they would go uh, as guard uh, when they took trucks out to, to supply other places. And he talked about coming on the, on the way back from, from one of these. And um, he, because it was hot, and you know, it's just like Texas, hot and sweaty and so forth. So he was on the second Amtrak. And they were coming back. And all the men were riding on the Amtraks by now because they had gone along this same path a few hours earlier and checking to, to look for, for uh, North Vietnamese and um, Viet Cong. And so uh, coming back, the first Amtrak hit um, what you would now call an IUD. Mm. Uh, uh, and it blew the Amtrak up. And there were men who were melted on the Amtrak. It was so much. And trying to, at that point, trying to save anybody you could save and, and get them, uh, call in helicopters to try to, to get them out. And he could have just as well been on the first Amtrak riding. And so when Daddy uh, listened to some of those tapes, you can see just how it just cut his heart out. Mm. And um, those were the things. Only two good things happened from my standpoint in 68. One, Lucinda DeShay Robb, 50 years ago in October, was born. And I could tell you all about that. <laughs> it focused me. And, and then wonderful on Christmas Eve of, of Frank Borman reading from Genesis. And we'll get to that, which we'll get to in one second. That, that is the, the, the way that the year ends, hopefully, uh, after what was almost an apocalyptic journey. L let me talk. We... Um, March 31st, 1968 is a, an important date in, in the Johnson canon. It is when, as Kyle mentioned, LBJ gives a speech to the American people in which he talks about uh, a bombing pause in Vietnam and the fact that he will not seek his party's nomination for another term as president. This is Lyndon Johnson who spent practically his whole adult life toward the acquisition and execution of power. Tom, um, why did, there's a, there are a lot of misconceptions about why LBJ opted not to run in 1968. What, what, what do you feel? Why did LBJ uh, decide to step down? I think the, the advice of Lady Bird Johnson. Yeah. Second. <laughs> Who said that, that before you, Lady Bird Johnson said, I saluted him for being clear-headed enough to know he wasn't the man who could unite the country. Second, he absolutely wanted to use the time he had left in office to try to bring about a peace agreement in Vietnam. Absolutely wanted to spend every moment that he could trying to bring about a peace in Vietnam. And third, his health. As he said to Larry Temple and to others, uh, the Johnson boys died young, meaning his family. Uh, and also, uh, we knew that he'd suffered a really severe heart attack earlier. And uh, he, was, uh, he was not a candidate for uh, you know, heart surgery at that point. Both Dr. DeBakey, Dr. Cooley, and his Emory University doctor who had been with it was not, and uh, so, uh, but, but, you know, he, he listened to many people, not too many, John Conley, certainly, um, among them, but there was no more powerful voice in all of that than, than Mrs. Johnson. Uh, you were, so, so John was an indispensable aide to President Johnson, and one of the things he did is, 
take copious notes uh, around the meetings that, that LBJ had, including weekly lunches around the war. Tom, talk about the commander in chief that you saw throughout the course of 1968. 68 was by far the most traumatic year for him. Um, he wanted to continue to do everything that he could do about bringing the war to a successful conclusion. He also wanted to continue to push forward on those domestic agenda items that he felt still needed to be, uh, to, 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 to be addressed. Um, it was a really, it was a serious time mm. in that White House uh, th 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 throughout the year. Um, he found refuge at the ranch. I mean, the ranch just brought him a safe harbor. Uh, and even though there were all of the, you know, communications technology there of, the, of that time, nothing pleased him more than to be able to get out in his car and drive around the ranch with guests, a chance to be with family, with friends, to play dominoes with A.W. Morrison. Uh, but mo mostly it was, uh, it, it was about the only getaway uh, that was available because we couldn't travel uh, during that year except primarily to military bases. Right. I mean, the protesters were, were everywhere. Um, but I just want to emphasize something that I think was true all the way through. He was a very steady hand in a crisis. And no matter what you may read in other publications or whatever, uh, he was a very good person in a crisis. He just wanted so much, some way, somehow, to maybe get Ho Chi Minh in a room and, and be able to negotiate with him as he had successfully with so many others along the way, Senator Dirksen and others. But peace eluded him. And, uh, and, and that was really, I think, the, the toughest part of that year. Yeah. There were many tough parts of that year. But for him not being able to bring that to a successful resolution. Uh, there are many who are close to the Johnson family who will say that uh, LBJ had really three surrogate sons, uh, Tom Johnson, Bill Moyers, and uh, Walter Jenkins. We have Walter Jenkins' daughter in the audience tonight. Bill, you knew him so well. Did it surprise you when you heard that speech on March 31st and, and heard he was stepping down? Yes, as you said, he was a man who spent his whole life seeking power. I saw him really bitterly disappointed, but uh, treating it privately when he didn't get the, when he, not only did he not get the Democratic nomination, but he didn't run a very good campaign and we didn't get many delegates. He just got outsmarted and outmaneuvered by John Kennedy. He was very disappointed then. Uh, and then I saw him in the first months of the vice presidency when he just seemed to have given up uh, ever any further ambition, although his ambition rarely rested. It was at least in neutral in those first two or three months of, uh, of the new administration. Then I left in January of 67. I stayed mm -hmm. about three and a half years and went on to become publisher of newspaper in New York. And we were watching the screen that night because we'd heard the president was going to make a speech. And I was dumbstruck because, as I said to my oldest son, who was 14 at the time, I think, this is not a man I would ever thought would have put the crown down once it had been uh, placed on his head. Right. Not voluntarily. Uh, I feared, you mentioned his health, I, I grew very worried about his, his heart. He used to talk to me a lot in the campaign of 64. You know, he went to, t he almost backed out. He talked about backing out to Mrs. Johnson and me uh, three months before the Democratic Convention at Atlantic City in 1964, mm -hmm. and it was all about his heart. Right. And, you know, my, he told me the same story. My, my, my father and others died young. So I did not think that he would give up power voluntarily, but I never doubted that he meant it when he did that night. I never thought this was a ruse. I mean, he was careful. He was, 
he, he was uh, the most competent man I ever know at, 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 at stagecraft on his terms. He was not a great person, not a great performer, but he knew how to craft the play so that he would know the scenes that were coming. Right. And he was not going to make a theater out of his decision to, to, to retire and then come back. And I never believed the article, I'd like to hear what you think about it, the articles, the uh, speculation that he was really doing this in effort to create sympathy and, and, uh, and that after Kennedy had died, had been assassinated, he really regretted that he uh, had stayed in and began to try to manipulate things. I, I couldn't find that believable given the conviction and of the character that I knew on the 31st of March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so well, I, tried, yeah. I, uh, I tried to convince him not to make the speech. Really? Yeah. I wasn't persuasive, but I felt I was concerned about how those people, how my husband and all those people who were over there would feel that he was deserting them, was leaving them. And um, I was, I was, angry is not the right word, because I knew that he was really doing the right thing. You know, sometimes when an issue is focused on a person, it becomes Obama's war. It becomes Johnson's war. It's what, what happened to Carter. They wouldn't release right. the, those the hostages. Iranian hostages I mean, our, our hostages, they wouldn't release them. It was just sticking the finger in his eye. And that was the kind. And I, th I think that he felt, honestly, that uh, if people thought he was doing this for a political reason, if he was staying in, that they, they, the Vietnamese would not come, because they didn't want to make peace with somebody that they were going to help get Reelected. That was going to be a re-election issue, and, um, um, and and it works. By the the overture yes. of stepping down in order to get Ho Chi Minh to the peace table works. In so far as Ho Chi Minh uh, reaches out to LBJ after that, and ultimately we don't get peace for for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. But I want to go back. Uh, Kyle mentioned the the fact that um, uh, there was a surge in LBJ's approval ratings after the March 31st speech. And then just several days later, we get the assassination of Martin Luther King. Tom Johnson is the aide that lets President Johnson know that Martin Luther King has been assassinated. LBJ is in an Oval Office meeting. Tom, talk about that moment. Well, again, I was a young press aide, and I just happened to be standing by the tickers, the AP and UPI tickers, uh, adjacent to the White House press office. The bells on the tickers went into a prolonged, unending stream uh, of, 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 of just continuing ringing that is called a flash. It's the highest form of a bulletin, way above a bulletin. And I just happened to be just looking at it, and, and it, the, the AP ticker began to line that Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot in Memphis. And it, it, I let about three sentences get off of it before I ripped it off, and which is really unusual, I went in and I told the President's two secretaries that I had to go only into the Oval Office, don't stop me, because normally you must stop and get their permission to go in. It is a, it's a criminal offense almost. And I said, this is so important that I need to, to get in. So I, I walked in and handed it uh, to the President. I didn't say anything. Sitting with them, this is always to be a great irony. Sitting with him was the then chairman of Coca-Cola, Mr. Robert Woodruff, and the outside general counsel of Coca-Cola, uh, who became the governor of Georgia, Governor Carl Sanders. And the president looked at it, and you could almost just see him slump uh, in it. And he handed it to Mr. Woodruff, who read it. And then, as he was doing that, the president was beginning his calls to uh, 
I think the first call was, was to, to J. Edgar Hoover, but he started down, the Attorney General went down the list, the, Se the Secretary of Defense, I mean, on it, and probably with, with, within no more than 10 minutes, probably less, coming into the Oval Office were first the highest ranking people in the White House, the Walt Rostos and, and, and others at the time, but, but then mobilizing in the White House were others. But I'll also never forget Mr. Woodruff, chairman of Coca-Cola, asked to use a phone as all of this is going on, and over the phone he calls the then Atlanta mayor, Ivan Allen, mm. and he says, Mayor, I'm here uh, with President Johnson. Uh, as you know, Dr. King has been shot. I, the, the FBI and others say that America could burn tonight. And uh, I want you to do whatever you need to do in Atlanta. Doesn't matter what kind of police force, additional fire, whatever you need to do, do it and don't worry about who pays for it. Uh, Mr. Woodruff was notorious for his, his anonymous philanthropy mm -hmm. in it. And of all the cities, Atlanta didn't burn that night. There were some serious protests, but, but in any case, President Johnson's, one of his very next calls was to Mrs. King uh, on it. Now, again, at the, at immediately, we just knew that he had been shot. Uh, it was later that we got the word that he had actually, he had actually died. But again, to watch President Johnson beginning to take control, and so many of his calls were, were to the African-American leaders, uh, not just to law enforcement and, 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 and getting every piece of knowledge he could, but what can we do now? And I should just, one thing I'll never forget is thank goodness America's African-American were led by Dr. Martin Luther King and John Lewis and Andrew Young and people who believe so much in nonviolence. Apostles of peace. Thank goodness that America's African American community was not led by Rep Brown and by Stokely Carmichael or maybe even Malcolm X because even though we did have riots, uh, the, 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 the civil rights community embraced nonviolence, even after their leader had been killed, as he did for, for several days. Not to say again that a lot of cities didn't burn, but, but President Johnson set in motion then uh, things like open housing and, 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 and much, much more. He again was just a solid, solid leader wanting to do the right thing under the conditions, terribly concerned about the the loss of Dr. King, who had been such a strong supporter as they worked together over civil rights, even though because Dr. King became an opponent of the war, their relationship had, had changed. You Let me just say a little personal piece on that. That, of course, we had the draft, and there were a lot of people who because they were in school, because they could afford um, to deferments. deferments. They could work out these things. They didn't go. Uh, they were people, the children of people in the government. Uh, you know, families were split greatly between the, the younger generation who you know, didn't, weren't willing to, to go by the draft. And um, um, so who got, who filled up that were a lot of people of color. And I understand perfectly what it, Dr. King was talking about. It was, they were, in many cases, his people who were going. Now, there were plenty of people like my husband. Um, and now, if you look in Congress, for instance, you know, you, you're still talking about war, and you don't have very many people there who have any experience in any of it, uh, or certainly in, in, in the government, with the ex exception, of course, the professional military people. Um, very scary. But even at that time, Daddy was thinking of me and my condition. And I didn't know this story, but he had a, a young secretary who was a good friend of mine. And 
Washington was burning. 14th Street was burning. Um, I mean, 14th Street, we're at 16th Street. So very close, you had parts of it that were burning. And um, it was, Daddy did not, he told a lot of the staff people at the White House, particularly the women. I have to tell you, he was sexist in that part. He did not want them going home at night because he was afraid that something might happen to them. And so sometimes he got White House cars to take them to their doors, even though they were not high-ranking people in, in the government. But anyway, the this, this secretary, he, um, uh, uh, mother, this was all the time it was burning, and I don't know what happened. But anyway, he came, uh, he called Phyllis, and he said, Phyllis, um, Linda's here by herself. And I know this must be concerning to her, and you know she's pregnant, and we're scared, we're concerned. Would you mind staying here tonight, um, sleeping in the room with her? And then he calls me, and he says, Linda, I'm really concerned about Phyllis getting home tonight <laughs> safely. Would you mind sharing? A bed with Phyllis. <laughs> Phyllis was Phyllis Bonanno. Phyllis Bonanno was Phyllis, the, an assistant to, to President Johnson. He was one of the many. In those days, we called people secretaries, and they were, it was not. It was, it was not, not a, pejorative. A, a pejorative. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were the ones that were the closest because they were the ones who, under the guidance of of um, the chief secretary, um, who who um, uh, let people in and out of the office. But I never knew that story until a few years ago when Phyllis did an oral history and told it. But he was concerned about the people who worked for him. Now, there were men. I don't know. Did he tell you you had to stay? <laughs> that, that night he did. He did. Um, he was very concerned about the people around him, and partic particularly about me. And so Phyllis spent the night. And we went up on went up on top of the White House, up on the top, and saw 14th Street burning. Excuse me for interrupting that part. No, it's shocking. Please. If come. I could add just, I think you're talking about the theme of how the president managed a crisis. That management uh, was very much on display after the uh, assassination of King. And I think you see it in several ways. One, you see Harry Byrd and uh, even Robert Byrd. Robert Byrd's mad because when he orders in federal troops, they're really not given uh, bullets. And Robert Byrd's calling the president and saying, well, let's shoot them. Only shoot the adults and only shoot them in the knee. But you know, you've got this surge. And his first question is, one, I want my generals to know these young men that are being sent in, these troops, many Vietnam veterans, they are not to fire on Americans. I don't want to turn this into a bloodbath. And I think the other part of it is he actually empathizes to a large degree with the African Americans. Mm -hmm. He has a great quote at one point saying, I understand why this young African American man would riot when he's seen his, civil, his leaders shot down and thinks he's next. Right. That empathy is very much on display after the assassination of King. And I think that sometimes in many of the biographies I read, a lot of that is lost, that he had this personal side, this empathetic side uh, that was very strong that unfortunately isn't oftentimes portrayed. You know, you can always, you can hear that in the telephone tapes. Mm -hmm. You can hear him personalizing every issue. When he's talking about a, an education bill, he talks about the guy at a gas station who's going to need yeah. to know how to work the cash register. Right. He does understand things. Yeah. I, I want to... Uh, we, we, there's so much to cover in this, this, this year, but I want to talk about King for just one more moment. Uh, before I forget, there is a letter that LBJ, a condolence letter that LBJ uh, wrote to Coretta Scott King that is on display in our great hall, and it's certainly worth seeing. It was given to us uh, by somebody who bought it from Harry Belafonte, um, who was given it by Coretta Scott King. Bill, I want to come back to you. You uh, were there in the White House from the beginning. You had helped LBJ see through not only the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which you talked to the presidential leadership scholars about today, but the Voting Rights Act. You, and, I, and I've heard conversations that you've had with President Johnson in which you talk about conversations you've, ha you've had with Dr. King. Give me your perspective, if you would, 
on that very consequential relationship between these two men. They realized they needed each other. John, I played the tape this afternoon of the president calling Martin Luther King three days after the assassination, and um, there was nothing uh, profound in the conversation, just one man reaching out to another, not actually knowing what to say, and the other one didn't know quite how to respond, but you could tell there was a moment there in which they had a fused uh, interest, and it was to uh, get the country started again, and, the, and, and LBJ said the Civil Rights Bill is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it happen. So there was a moment of rapport, even though they had not seen each other. I don't, I don't remember if King and Johnson ever met as vice president. Later, I, when I was talking to King, and I used it this afternoon, one of the things he said to me was that he had read the text of a speech that LBJ had made as vice president in this, on Memorial Day of 1963 at Gettysburg. Right. I, I told the group this afternoon that Johnson had been asked to speak, and he did, and he and Horace Busby from Austin wrote a marvelous speech. He was the first descendant of a Confederate also to speak at Gettysburg. Right. I didn't realize that. I think that's right. And he, uh, <clears throat> he made a marvelous speech in just absolutely the right tone and projection, and... Uh, and it was very moving. I don't have the last part of it that I quoted this afternoon. But King mentioned that to me. King mm. said, I, find, I didn't know he'd spoken there. And I finally read it. He said, that was the damnedest speech that I've heard in a long time from a white man like that in, 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 in power. So there was a natural bond there. Uh, Johnson thought then that Black Lives Matter 50 years before it became a mantra. And King saw that. But then, you know, King was very insecure in many respects. He was only 28 when he emerged as the leader of the Montgomery, Montgomery. boycott. And then he didn't mean it. He, he had once said, I, I'm going to have a great life. I'm the son of a distinguished black pastor in Montgomery. I've got a degree from Boston University. I've got a happy, uh, 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 be happily married. I, I wanted an ordinary life. And suddenly he was cast into this. And you could see this indecision in private conversations and phone conversations over that period of time. Then he grew furious with Johnson over a couple of things, and then Johnson grew furious with him. It was a, it was a, it was a mature uh, relationship in which feelings were not suppressed over resentment of what the other person might be doing that you didn't approve of. And then, of course, after I was gone, but after Kennedy, after uh, uh, King made that speech at Riverside Church in New York, April, I think, the 4th, 1967. The year, exactly a year exactly before. Exactly the died. year before. I'm told by journalists and others that Johnson was furious mm -hmm. and that he didn't really, uh, he really didn't want to deal with King anymore. And then, of course, I think that influenced the grief he obviously felt on the night that King was, was killed. Mm -hmm. So it was a rewarding, torturous, uh, flowering, and then uh, un, um, an inhibited relationship. One of the few cities that does not burn after Dr. King is assassinated is Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. Uh, Robert Kennedy is there that night campaigning for uh, the nomination of the Democratic Party, the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party. And he gives a, a, a beautiful um, extemporaneous speech to the largely African-American crowd that he has gathered that night. He's become a force in American life. Uh, and Kyle, you write of the relationship between the Kennedy camp and LBJ. You quote journalist William White, who wrote in December of 1966, President Johnson had to bear a frightful burden in the unremitting hostility of the Kennedy cult and its common attitude that the man in the White House is simply a constitutional successor to another man slain in memorable tragedy, but only a crude usurper. Talk about the relationship between uh, Lyndon Johnson and Robert Kennedy. Right. Well, let's start with the picture. I think the irony of John Kennedy's bust in the background is significant. 
And a lot of people will just see the picture of him. But again, if you juxtapose it against the Kennedy bust, I think it's extremely important to sort of contextualize that. So I think with Robert Kennedy, uh, one of the best books I think I've seen on this is Jeff uh, Shesaw's uh, book called Mutual Contempt about the uh, animosity between the two, which I think if you look at it, you can take it back to the 1960 convention when Robert Kennedy went out of his way to try to torpedo the uh, vice presidential nomination of Lyndon Johnson, and it didn't improve. I mean, on that November 22nd, you probably saw this happen when Robert Kennedy just walked by the uh, president goes straight to the back of the plane and just does not even acknowledge him. And this kind of relationship uh, was extremely tense. I argue that it's one of the most uh, volatile in American history. It's right up there with Hamilton and Burr, and you know, you look at, there's some others along the way, but you'd be hard pressed to find some that are as contentious as this relationship. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I've learned a lot from Bob Cabo's book. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned is I too thought this began uh, at the convention in, mm -hmm. in, in 60, I thought that Johnson felt Bobby was undercutting not only him, but right. the, his own brother. Right. And, um, but it turns out, as Cairo reports, it began before that. It began oh, yeah. in an incident in the basement of the Senate office building in their, in, in their yeah. or, or the Capitol in their restaurant. And there's a group meeting there, senators who are talking to Johnson, and Bobby comes in and and, and, and sort of ignores him, and, and they exchange some hostile words. Right. I never heard that. I never heard the president uh, talk about it. But go back and look at the cable. Oh, yeah. I, I think there's a, a, a things. I mean, Bobby was always insulted because I think he called him boy or something like this that mm -hmm. added to this. But, you know, I think Robert Kennedy, you hear Joe Kennedy talk about um, Bobby. He says, you know, Jack was just sort of this easygoing guy. He was not really my son in some ways. Bobby would cut your throat. That's my boy. <laughs> and, you know, he said he, he'd take you down. He said he was the tough one. And so I think this is a clash of um, two major political figures. And again, I, I talk about this in the book of that funeral for Robert Kennedy mm. and how he walks in. And I think it's Joe Califano that talks about the idea he could feel the tension in the room. And that there were people there that did think Johnson was just still an usurper, that they were going to ride in with Bobby Kennedy in 1968 and, become, and go into the presidency. And somehow they're blaming it on Johnson for creating all the turmoil that brought about the death of Robert Kennedy. So two months and two days after Martin Luther King is assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Bobby Kennedy dies after having been shot at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Uh, Tom, back to you. Um, what was that moment like for President Johnson? At least two of us who were present, uh, Jim Jones, uh, who, who was a, another presidential assistant, and I were there. And what I will remember was President Johnson telling us that we should do everything that the Kennedy family asked of us. And uh, that was basically, those were his instructions. And that for, for the next 24 to 48 hours, there was no request that wasn't answered uh, and answered immediately. Use of, of, of the presidential planes, use of the presidential helicopters, whatever it was that was needed by the, by the Kennedy uh, family. I mean, he, he uh, just, of course, he, he, he reached out to, uh, to, to talk with, uh, with Rose Kennedy. Uh, and, you know, there was a great sense of, uh, you know, what does this now mean, you know, with, with, what, what does this really mean? But, but my memory mostly, and I, maybe because I was just so involved uh, with it, at least one part of it, was just to make certain that every single request that was made of the White House or the presidency, that it was done. Mm -hmm. uh, not only has Kyle written a marvelous book on LBJ throughout the course of this year, but, but he also wrote a piece in the Washington Post about Lyndon Johnson's response to uh, Robert Kennedy's assassination and the lessons that uh, Donald Trump might draw from it when we see the, the almost, I think, inevitable uh, 
uh, death of, um, of, of Senator McCain, another politi uh, his own political rival. Talk about that piece a little bit, yeah. Kyle. Well, living in Arizona, you live in the shadow of John McCain uh, and as someone that's been there for many years. And so it just made a lot of sense to me that, you know, here's Lyndon Johnson, his greatest political rival, a bitter rivalry. He's able to set it aside. And I mean, to me, one of the most poignant parts of his uh, is when he's in the motorcade, they're going to Arlington, and they're on the way back, and he, is, he sheds tears because he's like, how does this woman, Rose Kennedy, who has suffered so much, you know, and, and again, when you read the Johnson biography, you don't get very much of this of the personal side, that he had this sense of empathy, that he had this sense of caring. And the point I was trying to make to the president, uh, the current president, was you've got to put aside this because this is the presidential thing to do. And if you don't, then you will be judged for that. You can follow Lyndon Johnson's uh, model of doing whatever the family. He flew the kids out. He did everything that they asked showed remorse, showed concern, and you put that aside for that moment because that's the presidential thing to do. Yeah. And the same needs to be replicated when Senator McCain passes. And that was my argument very strongly, and Lyndon Johnson provided the model. I but, just think it's important to mention that the relationship between President Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy, Lady Bird Johnson, President Johnson, was a good relationship. I mean, a good relationship. And, and later, I should emphasize that relationship with Senator Edward Kennedy and, and the Johnsons was a wonderful relationship. So, so many people do put this in one bucket, like the Kennedy family right. really disliked President Johnson. That is not true. And let me just say that when Lucinda Robb was born, I got a beautiful note from Ethel Kennedy. And, and when Daddy died, Mrs. Kennedy brought a little thing of flowers to, to um, Blair House, where we were, where we were staying. Um, so. And I don't think it's, I don't think, I, I usually try to keep all secrets, but I don't think this is one that Mrs. Johnson would mind my saying. But virtually every summer uh, at Martha's Vineyard, where Mrs. Johnson would go for a few, a couple, two or three weeks, uh, Mrs. Johnson and Jacqueline Kennedy had a completely private evening, afternoon, and evening together. Uh, as far as I know, for every summer that we were there. I went. I got invited to go. So, so I guess the point is, yes, there was hostility both ways between. Robert Kennedy and President Johnson. Um, but, but don't just think about it as Kennedy family, mm -hmm. Johnson family at all. It's not monolithic. No. No, it's, it's as different as each individual in the family. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Kyle, you mentioned Anna Chenault. And this is a chapter that many of you may not know about in 1968. Um, t tell the audience ab about Anna Chenault's significance in the 1968 election. Right. Well, Anna Chenault, uh, wife of Claire Chenault, the famous flying tiger, uh, they had married and she'd come to the United States and become a prominent uh, Republican fundraiser. So she's very actively involved. She also keeps a lot of contacts in Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole. And so what happens is as early as July of 1967, uh, you have people from the Nixon campaign meeting with her, also with the uh, South Vietnamese ambassador to the United States, Bu Zim. And uh, there is this argument that has been made and will be followed up on is that Chenault went out of her way to try to convince the two government not to negotiate in late October of 1968 when there were a period there was gonna be a major breakthrough, which they feared was gonna be the ultimate October surprise and throw the election to Hubert Humphrey. So this had been ongoing and they really ratcheted it up. And what happens is the president gets wind of this through Eugene Rostow, who overheard a conversation in New York City, passes it along to Walt Rostow, who passes it along to the president. And so this plays out, the president then goes and wiretaps the Chenault's phone at the Watergate, ironically. Uh, <laughs> can't make this stuff up. 
the, the, Jake Tapper was here a couple weeks ago, and he said uh, that the, his, the, the, the history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it rhymes. Yes, <laughs> very, very much so. And so he also taps the South Vietnamese uh, embassy. We also had a tap through well, the. It, it had been tapped. Yeah, it, it been, and so had the uh, embassy or the presidential palace in South Vietnam by the NSA. So this intelligence by the FBI starts coming in of these conversations going on between Bu, uh, Zem, also to the two government, and the argument is made that this was an effort uh, to undermine the peace process. Now the question becomes, how effective was it? Some in the South Vietnamese government said, well, we weren't going to do it anyway. So it doesn't really make a difference. But the fact that this was actively going on and you have Chenault talking to someone in Albuquerque at one time. That's one of the great wiretaps. Right. Of He's in Albuquerque, and they think it's Spiro Agnew, which would fit within. John Mitchell was actively involved. Yeah. And so this is all playing out. And the president, and I had a piece in the San Antonio paper a, a few months ago talking about how I thought there was a comparison of why Obama didn't pull the trigger as well as the president. One, the president, Johnson, would have given up that he was where his information was coming mm -hmm. from, which would have been, some would say, embarrassing. But he also loved the office of the president. And he thought, if I start a constitutional crisis, as soon as, because it appeared Richard Nixon was going to win, I open up a constitutional crisis immediately. And that undermines the presidency itself. Right. So he ultimately did not make this public. He also gave the information to Hubert Humphrey, who also chose not to make it public. Tell them, though, about the Haldeman note of last year, yeah, the whole finally thing. the smoking gun, finally. So I, this was speculation years for years, but there was no smoking gun that led back to Richard Nixon. I think we have to stop, go back one more step, because Daddy talked to, to Dirksen again. Yes. Right. And told Dirksen that he had this information. And Everett Dirksen, the, the yeah. minority, the, the, the Republican minority leader of the Senate. Who he was very close to. and. Um, uh, he told him, and there was a discussion about whether this was a, a, a treasonous whether offense. this was treason right. uh, to be dealing with a foreign government. Uh, and here, uh, um, and Dirksen presumably talked to Nixon. He did, and said, and Nixon said, "I know nothing about it. No, no, nothing right. at all. And I'll do everything I you, I can." To, to get right. you know to get peace and so forth and so forth now well and so yeah I, I appreciate the context I hopefully my chapter covers it in great detail well, but uh, it, it is that is a wonderful point he uh, Dirksen does call uh, Hardesty I think is the one that answers and delivers the message he goes through Haldeman because Haldeman Nixon's sleeping and Haldeman says he's asleep Hardesty says you're gonna get him up for this and then there's the great tapes that you can hear Nixon and Johnson going back where he is denying it, uh, but your father did not truly believe that that was the case because he had the tapes, or he had the, uh, uh, what Anna Chenault had been doing. And, and again, you know, you think of Henry II. <laughs> you know, did, uh, did somebody in an attempt to help Nixon, right. um, but here you have, it but wasn't a surprise. Yeah, the Haldeman that, note that is basically is the smoking uh, a smoking gun. Now there are still people that are not convinced, uh, and their argument. Uh, uh, there was a good piece in the Wall Street Journal by Luke Nichter, uh, a professor very close to here, arguing that it dis since it didn't make a difference, they were already going to go the route they were. It doesn't matter. I, I personally disagree with that assumption. But the Haldeman note is saying, yeah, we 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 know. And, you know, it, it, it is a tie. Again, not everybody buys that it's a smoking gun. But to me, it is a very strong. Some people have asked me in the process of my interviews on the book, they say, did Nixon know? And I say, well, here's what I would argue. I, and I'm not a lawyer, but if I were, I'd say in a criminal case, I'd have a very difficult time convincing the whole jury. If it was it's important for everybody here to understand, though, that we have a very good relationship with so many of the Nixon staff, the Nixon friends, the Nixon family. I don't want anybody to leave this segment of the program uh, thinking uh, other than we're just trying to convey facts here. And, and, and I will just, from my point, end with one opinion. I do believe that if I had been authorized to leak uh, 
that information about Anna Chenault and the South Vietnamese government being convinced to pull back from the Paris peace talks, I believe if that information had been made public that there would have been a difference in the election of 1968 right. and that Hubert Humphrey would have been president, not, not President Nixon. And that's not, I mean, it, 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 and that whole of a note actually showed at the Nixon Library last year the specific instructions to tell Anna Chenault to continue her efforts to get President Tu of South Vietnam to pull back. I also think about how many people died both on the United States side in Vietnam and on the North Vietnamese side uh, between then. Could we have brought off a peace? The Russians really wanted us to bring about a peace. It came out of Glassboro. And I always just think, maybe of everything that happened in 68, if we could have in that final months done a, a, some type of ceasefire, brought about a resolution, maybe even the type of resolution that existed between North and South Korea, how many lives would have been saved mm. on both sides and it's the only time that I guess I look back and I knew just enough. I'm sorry I didn't even ask for approval to leak it or, or get it because I think it would have changed the course of history. Well, I was at Glassboro with Daddy. Gla and Glassboro, the summit. Is it, is it with Kosygin. And I understand that that's where, where Daddy talked to Kosygin about getting the the uh, the Russians to get the North uh, North Vietnamese to come to the table because my real question always was why were they there not not why would South Vietnam pull back because you know they'd thought about the the shape of the table and where everybody sat and you know these things but why were the North Vietnamese willing to come to the table right. Right. I mean, the, I, unfortunately, we are. Uh, this is a, 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 a. We could talk about 1968 uh, for four or five more programs and still not scratch the surface of this. But we are unfortunately we're timing out. Exactly. Let me quote. Uh, uh, Kyle quotes uh, Atlantic Monthly in his um, in his book, talking about that year. Never in our history, they wrote at the time. As the individual seemed as wretched and despairing as he is today, and seldom have free men anywhere felt so thwarted and powerless in their relations to government democratically chosen. He also mentions that by 1968, um, a study found that one out of every, or that 28 percent of Americans were quote substantially alienated from the mainstream. Such numbers led pollster George Gallup to conclude, all the time we've been operating, 32 years now, I've never known any time like this when people are so disillusioned and cynical. And Bill Moyers, that sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> <laughs> How does um, this uh, tempestuous, monumental year half a century ago compared to the year that we're living in right now? Well, many of the forces, stresses, issues are the same. Uh, distrust of government, continuing uh, division and the races. I mean, the, we didn't talk about it, but to me, the most meaningful uh, subplot in this 1968 was the Kerner Commission, a great document which LBJ commissioned and then grew very wary of, but it came out with the report that America is now two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. It was a unanimous decision. It was a powerful testament. Uh, and it's the same today in many respects. We are still economically and in equality. We are uh, divided. This, this, I think, that I'm not a historian, but I think 1968 had more impact on American history than any other year I lived through, uh, even though I lived through the First World War, I mean, the Second World War, and oh. Uh, but, and he looks fabulous. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
You should see me in uniform. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I was in France a good bit in 68, and, I, the, 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 and in Britain, in London, and this feeling of politics alive, politics powerful, politics going to change things, which dominated, which, which governed the, quote, 300,000 revolutionaries who, walk, who marched through the streets of Paris uh, calling for de Gaulle to quit. And in Poland, when the, uh, a movement of ordinary, everyday young citizens grew up, and all Europe was caught up in this, more so than America. America was against the, the Vietnam War American protest, and black people were protesting against police brutality. By the way, the, the Kerner Commission concluded their sociologist, very good sociologist on that commission concluded that white racism was not the trigger that brought about the protest. It was police brutality, which was incredible at that period of time. Didn't get a lot of press as it is today. But uh, it, there were such expectations in the beginning of the 60s mm. and such disillusionment at the end that 1968 became the kind of, of uh, landfill for so many hopes that wound up uh, pessimistically. And there's one image in my mind that has epitomized that year for me. I, I had gone to New York to publish a newspaper. One of my constituents was Robert Kennedy, and I saw more and knew him better in New York than I did in Washington. Because then I was Johnson's representative and our relationships were formal and, uh, and all of that. But he called and asked me to fly to Kennedy's, uh, to a Martin Luther King's funeral with him. And I did. He was a completely different man from the man I had seen in LBJ suite in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles in 1960. Uh, we hope everyone matures in power, and I think Kennedy was maturing in power. He was a much different man. Mm. But what I remember of the scene that stands in my mind as, the, as, as, as reflective of that whole half of that, that decade, all the people gathered there, most, many blacks, many whites, they tried to sing, they started out singing, We Shall Overcome, trying to, and it died in their throats. It choked. They couldn't sing it. This was their anthem. This was their hymn. And it had become when Lyndon Johnson made that great speech that Dick Goodwin wrote, Dick Goodwin's memorial service is tomorrow in Concord, Massachusetts. He gave Lyndon Johnson an eloquence that every president wants, and that fortunately Dick gave uh, LBJ. But but when Lyndon Johnson stood before the Congress and the country and, and appropriated the black freedom message, we shall overcome, which is the thread that runs through the history of, of these people since slavery. The country changed at that moment. We had a real chance. And when they couldn't sing it, mm -hmm. after a white president had made it ours and his and theirs, when they could sing it, it was a moment to me mm -hmm in which lights were going out uh, all over the country. And of course, what happened is all those hopes and expectations of the protesters, the counter-revolution, the war went on for seven years. In France, Pompidou was elected. Mm -hmm. In England, Heath. Uh, and uh, a conservative Nixon in the United States. There was a backlash. Just there was a historic backlash against uh, the emancipation of of slaves, the reconstruction, the failure of the reconstruction. There was a backlash against Obama today. Right. 1969 saw the beginning of the backlash that, and, and the rise of the right wing, who had been marginalized. They brought the delusional into the Oval Office and gave it the crown. But, but they, <laughs> there was a backlash. And, mm -hmm. and we're, they, this election of 2016 mm -hmm. was the culmination of the backlash that began with 
the resentment of blacks, you know, people were saying, uh, oh, they, w they want more than they deserve, and all right. there's a real backlash. Right. But that scene, to me, remains the painting in my head that captures the disillusionment and sadness and, and hopelessness of 1968. We've talked about some very dark chapters that we saw throughout 1968. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, the year ended on a very hopeful note. The, the image that you see now projecting in back of us came from the Apollo 8 mission. Apollo 8 was the first uh, space mission to go beyond Earth's gravitational force. And it circumnavigated the moon. Men did not land on the moon, but we had a crew circumnavigating the moon, actually journeying 60 miles from the moon's surface. And that picture was taken by Bill Anders, one of the astronauts on that mission. And it spawned the modern environmental movement as we saw the fragility of the Earth on which we all live. This image was sent by LBJ to all world leaders at the end of that year. And he got a response from one of them, unlikely, uh, an unlikely response from Ho Chi Minh, who thanked him for sending him this image. I will say before I thank our, our panelists tonight that uh, there are six, at least 60 members of this audience who give us great hope, and those are the presidential leadership scholars. As Larry Temple mentioned, they are doing some absolutely remarkable things. And uh, during this dark time, what, what, a time that can be dark, uh, you all are giving us extraordinary hope. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to my panel for being here as well. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks. What happened in two weeks?